It's Veterans Day. We're talking about all things veteran here on Chris Fabry Live. A few months ago, I saw a, a report about Vietnam veterans and an anniversary dinner that was conducted that uh, mirrored a dinner when President Nixon opened the White House and had, uh, for returning prisoners of war, had a, a dinner for them. And as the the footage, the reel showed, here comes John McCain walking toward an airplane after being released, and right behind him, a man that I've known for a number of years. I met him first in his work with Larry Burkett. His name is Lee Ellis. Well, this morning, Oklahoma Governor Mary Fallon spoke, and Lee gave the keynote address at the Veterans Park Wall dedication in Enid, Oklahoma. This evening, he's going to be speaking at the Legacy Award Ceremony. He's the author of Leading with Honor, Lessons from the Hanoi Hilton. Lee, at Colonel... It's great to have you back with us. How are you today? Oh, I'm doing great. It's just been a, we had a wonderful celebration there in Enid, Oklahoma today as they dedicated, uh, they actually bought and established permanently one of the moving walls, an 80% replica of the uh, Washington, D.C. Vietnam Veterans Memorial. So it's been a really, really good day. Yeah. So what did you say? You gave the the main address there. What did you tell the people assembled? Well, first of all, I recognized the veterans, and there were many there. There was, you know, probably several thousand there. And their contribution to our society, you know, their sense of responsibility and resourcefulness that veterans bring home with them after their training and service uh, and taking leadership and roles in the, they play in the community. Uh, and then I talked about the losses that we all suffered in the war and the people who didn't come home. You know, as a POW, the worst nightmare was that you would be left there and left behind. So we always try to get our name and our shoot-down date or capture date and our branch of service out to anybody we could contact, which was contact was covert because we weren't allowed to communicate overtly. And, you know, not wanting to be forgotten and how important it is for we Americans not to forget our veterans who didn't come home. Uh, those of us who came home, we have a real responsibility to not let those who couldn't, uh, but not let them be forgotten. I know I lost four roommates from flight school, combat training, and the war. And then as a POW, there were four uh, men, wonderful, great men who didn't come home. The names are on that wall. That uh, it's always a good time for me to connect, reconnect with them, and to grieve the loss that we suffered. Yeah. So it makes a lot a lot of. When you go to Washington D.C. or there in Oklahoma, the, one of the moving walls. When you go there, what goes through your mind as you look at those names? Well, I just I think of these men that I knew and cared about, and were teammates, and how. They paid the ultimate sacrifice, and their families, I think about their families, and the sacrifice that just continues on for them. Uh, and then I think about, you know, the blessing that I had to be able to come home, and why, who knows why I did and they didn't. No, we'll never know those kind of things. It's just part of God's plan that we don't understand. And I just realized that my purpose, part of my purpose in life is to honor them, to live in a way that honor them, honors them, and also to kind of keep their memory alive, at least their sacrifice. Yes. I saw this uh, news report and an interview that Diane Sawyer did with you and two other veterans, two other prisoners yep. of war. I want to play a, a little one-minute clip from that, and here you'll hear Lee's voice, I believe, first here, talking about how long he spent as a POW. Here it is. Captured November the 7th, 1967, and there for 1,955 days. 2,103 days in the prison camp. 1,900 days in prison. And 40 years later, they still recognize the squeaky gate from that prison hell. They're coming for somebody, and it ain't good. They beat my good friend to death over the first month on his wounds. Captain Guy Gruder says as he listened to the screaming, he knew his only choice was to ask God to teach him how to forgive. I got on my knees heavy, and after three months of heavy prayer, real heavy prayer, I'm talking hours a day, I could finally form just in my mind the words, you know, Lord, 
uh, forgive them. So I was praying for them, praying for the captives. That's the G. Through their prison walls, the they tapped letters to each other, for God bless you. you, and came away with lessons about what courage really is. What is it? Courage is fear that has said its prayers. None of us was as strong as we wanted to be or we thought we would be. Courage is not always, the, you know, the end of the fight. Uh, courage is a process. November 7, 1967. You probably remember that day pretty vividly, don't you, Lee? Well, I sure do. Uh, we just uh, celebrated our, I think it was our 46th anniversary of being shot down uh, last, uh, actually, last week, November the 7th. And my partner that was in the airplane with me, I called him and checked in, and we talked about that day. So it was a very uh, important day in our lives. Our lives changed forever that day when that airplane blew up under us, and we had to jump out and parachute out in enemy territory, and they were waiting for us on the ground. So it did. It altered my life forever. And you know the thing, Chris, uh, God, I grew up in a Christian home, and so I had strong faith. And when I was able to live through that experience and actually be taken to the Hanoi Hilton, and I was bombed and straight three times by American air power en route to north to Hanoi, and then the local populace tried to kill me three times. And uh, my enemy, the soldiers, actually had to protect me to take me into Hanoi. When I experienced all that, it was pretty clear to me that God was in control. I wasn't, and my job was just to stay alive and to live out the purpose that he had designed for me and to honor him. Hmm. Did you go through that same thought process of getting to the point of even thinking about forgiveness for your t captors? Yes, I think, you know, the last two years of the war, we had uh, the treatment changed thanks to the American people really putting a lot of pressure on the communists. They, the, the North Vietnamese government, communist government, changed our treatment, and it went more to live and let live. And during those two years, we had time to reflect and think about going home and what were we going to be like. And I think we realized that bitterness was not going to serve us well, and so we had time to kind of allow that to kind of wash away week by week, talking with our buddies uh, in the cells there, what we're going to be like when we went home, what was life going to be like, and how we're going to face it. And I think we all came to the conclusion that bitterness would, would just take us out. It would ruin us. And so we learned to forgive and had to be intentional about it and to realize that we just needed to be thankful rather than bitter. And so I think most of us, at our 40th anniversary in May, you mentioned earlier the 40th anniversary of the POW re return, and we had that reunion. The predominant theme was uh, thankfulness and gratefulness and joy that we'd come home and been able to have a good life. And uh, I think uh, as I spoke today in Edith, Oklahoma, I said, you know, we were celebrating Veterans Day today, but it's a few weeks to Thanksgiving, and it's a, it's a good time to start uh, taking on that uh, gratefulness in our hearts because that really frees us up. Hmm. You know, that mirrors something that I, I had a conversation with another person in the Philippines this morning who was saying that same thing in, in church yesterday, that the people were there, they were grieving, they, you know, a lot of them didn't know what was going to happen around the corner, but they were just grateful to God for being able to be alive, especially with the great loss of life around them. So anytime you get into that kind of a crucible, it will cause you to either go one way or the other toward thanksgiving or toward the bitterness, as you say. Right. You know, uh, Viktor Frankl, uh, whom I had the pleasure to meet right after we came home, in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, uh, he says there's a, uh, when there's a, a situation, uh, there's a space between the stimulus and the response, and in that space lies a choice, and in that choice lies our freedom. I think that's true. When we face a crucible, we have the opportunity to make a choice uh, to be bitter or to be thankful. And, uh, you know, if you choose uh, being thankful, you move toward freedom. If you choose bitterness, you, you move toward shackles and imprisonment. Yes. Yes. Isn't that something how it wraps you up? That, that and, and even if you're not listening, you know, this is we're talking about veterans, but if you're listening and you are bitter and your your anger is turned to bitterness 
that is wrapping you up. It's not doing anything against, you know, you, you think about the North Vietnamese, your bitterness toward them wasn't doing anything against them. You know, they, they didn't care about that. But when uh, they see in you this striving toward forgiveness, that process, there's something different there, isn't there? Well, it is. It's freeing uh, to the individual and it's freeing to the other person eventually. Uh, at least it it's uh, it's freedom in our mind. The other person may not accept it if it's somebody in a family member. I see families sometimes where there's some bitterness going on and, uh, you know, but it has to start with freeing yourself from that bitterness and then you, you afford the other person the opportunity also uh, yes. for that same freedom. They may or may not take it. But Lee I, Ellis, I think, uh, go ahead. G- Lee Ellis is founder and president of both Leadership Freedom and Freedom Star Media. He spent five years in a POW prison in Vietnam or in, in different ones. He's a United States Air Force colonel. And if you want to find out more about him, you can go to the website, chrisfabrylive.org. We've linked to Leading with Honor, his book that he wrote, Lessons Learned from the Hanoi Hilton. In the few moments that we have left, what, what lessons did you learn there that you've taken with you throughout the rest of your life? Well, I think the first one is to know yourself, uh, because you, you have to lead yourself first. So know yourself, know your strengths, know your struggles. You know, I joined Larry Burkett to develop that career direct assessment, and that was what that was all about, knowing yourself. Also knowing your values, and then guarding your character. You, have, you can't just assume your character. You have to commit to it and work at it uh, every day. And I think that's something we all need to be aware of. And then you have to learn to confront your doubts and fears. We all have doubts and fears. Everybody does. And this is the biggest challenge, I think, for leaders in America today. Don't give in to your doubts and fears. Figure out what's the right thing to do. Lean into the pain of your fears and go do what's right. And when you do that, you always look back and be proud of it. Yes. And isn't that, it's human nature to run away from the fear and to have doubt, and so you go a different way. But you're saying, if you go toward that thing that you fear the most, the world is going to be different at the end after after you deal with that. Exactly. That is correct. And it sometimes you need to, may need to get some counsel. You need to come up with a plan of how to go at that, uh, lean into that pain of your fear. But when you do, uh, you have to walk through it. You just have to take, start taking steps toward it, forward. And, uh, you know, it's usually not as bad as it seems like it's going to be. And usually there's a lie underneath that fear. You know, Satan's got a lie. He's planted in your mind. He's hoping that you're going to pick up on and listen to. And when you sort through and get the truth, and then you just lean into that truth and start walking toward freedom and towards the, uh, uh, into the fear, and just do what's right. Do your duty. Do what, you know... Uh, what you know is right, and 99% of the time, we know what's right. Yeah. Do you still carry scars from the Hanoi Hilton? Uh, probably uh, probably do. I'm not as aware of them, but I have been gaining freedom over the years, and especially in the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, I had a nature to, because of that experience, to be more controlling that I needed to be about things I didn't need to control. Uh, I had to learn that and kind of let go of things to some degree. Uh, Anger was a problem at times, and uh, most people didn't see that, but it was there, and my family saw it sometimes, so I had to learn to let go of the anger. And just uh, some things like that, I think there were real scars. The hypervigilance was another. And all those things really kind of went back to my war experience and to some degree my personality as well. Yeah. What do you say to those who are coming back now from Afghanistan or they've come back from Iraq and other venues and they're dealing with those memories, PTSD and others? Yeah, I think uh, the one thing we learned, the Vietnam POWs learned, was that that time together, those last two years being together with our buddies who had gone through the same experience was invaluable for us to begin to uh, break free from some of the PTSD-type stuff. 
I think if we'd come home two years early, we'd have been a mess. So I think you need to be with friends who've been through it, but in a, in a good circumstance and good situations, because those people who have been through similar things, they understand what you've been through. They can relate to it. Secondly, uh, one of the things that's helped me along the way is getting into some counseling. And my wife, being a, a counselor, she's a certified counselor, has helped me a lot because her knowledge and experience and wisdom uh, has helped me to deal with some things. And then reconnecting from time to time with my old buddies and letting them share what's going on in their lives has been helpful. So, And I think finally, just a real commitment to, to grow. I knew that I had problems in areas, and we all do. And so my goal has been to uh, coach myself, learn to coach myself to a higher level of performance personally and professionally and always be learning and growing. What a pleasure. Lee Ellis, author of Leading with Honor. You can find out more about it at chrisfabrylive.org.